<laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, both of you, for making time. I know your, your schedule has been very busy. Um, but Yaron, you came um, highly recommended to me. I live, I'm working on an idea for peace where really I just want to get different perspectives and insights from economists around the world and their take on um, how some of our global systems have been impacted by COVID-19 and um, which ones they feel need to be disrupted and changed and, 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 dis and discuss how, what is a way forward to doing that. Um, I know there's, that's a very big kind of lofty concept. So <clears throat> the, the angle for the piece might change the more people I talk to, but you were my first economist <laughs> that I'm speaking with. I normally write about the intersection of technology and social impact sure. Um, sure. and global innovation. But um, I, I'm just doing a little research on you and, and objectivism and um, some of your perspectives on globalization. Um, for the everyday person who does not know what objectivism is, would you explain that? Sure. So, I mean, objectivism is really a philosophy, not an e economic theory. And it's, it's a philosophy that basically advocates for uh, a morality of kind of rational long-term self-interest of people pursuing their happiness and figuring out what is the best uh, life to live and how to live it in a way that they're not being sacrificed to other people and other people don't sacrifice to them. Uh, in in politics, and and the primary way of doing that is by using your mind and and uh, following reason, and by engaging with other people primarily in relationships of trade, of win win relationships, and taking responsibility over your own life primarily through producing, making the stuff that you can making, uh, taking responsibility over uh, producing enough so that you can you can live and and uh and and that that basically means working and and uh, having a career and taking that really really seriously and then politically that implies politically economically that implies a system that basically leaves us free to do exactly that to live our lives to pursue our happiness to choose our own values to follow a career to produce to create to build and that's a system of capitalism in which in which uh the government is limited, really, in its function to the protection of our rights, the protection of our freedoms, but otherwise leaves us alone and uh, and allows us to live our lives as we see fit. And uh, you know, so that's that's kind of in a, on a very very you know quick basis, kind of the the, the idea of objectivism. Is that something you think is possible with everything that's going on? in the world right now with the crisis? Or do you think it it was before or could be when there's a vaccine and when things calm down, whenever that may be? No, I think it's always possible and necessary and more necessary now than ever. Uh, we need more now than ever guidance. Uh, reason, I mean, a lot of what's happening in the world right now is panic, emotion, uh, projection, it's speculation, it's, you know, we, we, what we lack right now is data, knowledge, and we lack leaders who actually lead from the perspective, from a thoughtful perspective. We have leaders that emote, we have leaders that provide us with two alternatives, we're all going to die, or we have to shut the entire world down, and that's it, there's nothing in between, there's no more thoughtful approach. Uh, we have leaders who don't view the value of testing, obviously, because we're not testing. So data is not important to them. And we also, in terms of the population, we want a population that thinks about pursuing their own self-interest, but thinks about that in the context of other human beings and in the context of long-term flourishing and, and pursuing happiness. And that means being responsible in terms of your behavior and, and what that looks like, uh, rather than on the one hand, people who are, yeah, let's go to the beach, let's party, you know, doesn't matter who cares about tomorrow. But on the other hand, no, no, this is, I'm so scared I'm going to hunker down and live in my basement for the next two years until there's a vaccine. No, we need rational people focusing on true risk assessment and figuring out how to live even when there's a lot of uncertainty and, and we're not exactly sure what exactly is going on, but in a way that's responsible to our lives and responsible to the people around us. <clears throat> yeah, I, I fully agree with that point. 
Um, are there any particular infrastructures or global systems that you've been keeping uh, a very a closer eye on than others in terms of things that, you know, I mean, none of our systems are really set up for equity or they're not, there's no such thing as being equitable really in, in, in some of the, the systems, right? So it's, it's, uh, you're like, well, maybe, but, um, I'm not sure about some that. of the, some, well, some of the problems that have existed in some of them are possibly more amplified or magnified right now. Um, yeah. are there any systems in particular where you would like to see changes made and are hoping that they could be made in light of everything going on, whether that's the financial system, education system, or food system, political system, energy systems, um, because I see so much happening in the world of business, in the private sector, and startups, in terms of people wanting to create more equality, people wanting to, have, you know, whether it's doing an unconscious bias program or building the pipeline more for equity or whatever it is, and they do these programs, but it's really the underlying systems that that I find problematic with the way that things are going. These businesses can have all the programs, mm -hmm. you know, they can keep churning them out and doing great things. But, but if the systems are, are stuck, then, then what do we do? Well, we probably disagree on what the problems are. That is, I don't believe that there's a problem of inequality. I don't believe that equality should be a goal. I don't think equality is a good thing. I, I believe in freedom. And freedom generates inequality. That, it just does. It always does. Under all conditions, it does. When you take any group of people and you leave them free, you leave them alone to do their thing, you'll get inequality. And that's a beautiful thing. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we should celebrate inequality and not try to get rid of it. I think it's very dangerous and ultimately very violent to get rid of inequality. And I think the reason these systems don't work is because the only real way to get rid of inequality is through violence. Um, I mean, how do you make me and LeBron James equal in basketball? You can't. It, but other than if you break his legs and break his arms or something like that, violence, right? How do you make me and Bill Gates equal in wealth? Well, you steal his money and you give it to me. But that's violence. That's stealing. There is no such thing as equality. We have to get rid of that. The only equality that means anything, the only equality that the founders of America implied when they wrote All Men Are Created Equal in the Declaration of Independence even though they didn't live up to that, but, but they implied it, is an equal, a political equality, equality of freedom, equality of rights, equality before the law when the law is focused on protecting our rights. So creating a level of playing field, not in, not in an economic sense, but in a political sense, in the sense of we're all free to go out and pursue our lives, to, to try to build, to try to create, to try to make, and recognizing that we all start from different starting points. We all have different advantages and disadvantages. That's just reality. I can't change the genes I have. I can't change the parents I have. I can't change the wealth that my parents had and the opportunities they gave me or didn't give me. Given all that, I want to maximize my opportunities. I actually wrote a book. It's behind me. I didn't put it. I didn't know we were going to talk about it, but it's called Equal is Unfair. And we talk about all this stuff. And, and, and this is exactly what it's focused on. So when I look at the infrastructures in the world, I see what, I'm, what I try to maximize is not equality. I don't care about in equality of, of outcome, equality of, of economic equality, or even equality of opportunity, which I think is a bogus concept. What I care about is maximizing opp opportunities for everybody, for the poor, for the middle class, for everybody should be maximized opportunities. And the I know only one way to do that. And I think objectively in history, there's only been one way to do that. That is through freedom. I want to liberate markets, liberate individuals. So when I look at the world, I look at where are the bottlenecks for liberty? Where are the bottlenecks for opportunity? And I see them all over the place. <laughs> so it's hard for me to say what infrastructure would I like to be changed because I like to change almost all of them because I think all of them are constrained today. Are limited, but but given the coronavirus, given what the time we're living through, the one that is obvious that needs to be liberated is healthcare. I mean, healthcare is a mess. It's a disaster, and it's not surprising. It's a mess, a disaster. It's heavily, heavily, heavily controlled by government. If you look at the three areas where in the United States you see prices go up and quality goes down, three areas: healthcare, education 
and housing. All areas completely controlled by government. All areas where government constrains the supply and regulates the demand and regulates every aspect of it. If you want to see prices drop and quality go up in healthcare, education, and housing, get the government out of the way. Liberate it, just like Silicon Valley has little restraints on development of technology. And as a consequence, as prices go down and quality goes up, you need the same thing in healthcare. I would love to see, and I think the response to coronavirus is a great indication of that. Why couldn't we test early on? Because the FDA wouldn't allow testing. And the CDC decided that it was going to design the best test in the world and the only test in the world. And central planning doesn't work. I mean, I always ask people, what would this look like? This is an iPhone, right? What would this look like if a government committee designed it? And everybody laughs. Well, why do we let a, com a government committee design our healthcare system? Why do we let bureaucrats decide which tests are good and which tests are bad? Which drugs and which procedures are good and which bad? Don't we trust our doctors? Aren't our doctors smart? And can't they read the medical journals? And can't they figure this out? And would, couldn't the market have a replacement for the FDA? And, and So I would love to see a true free market in healthcare. And imagine, you know, why do we have so few hospital beds? Fewer than in the entire Western world we have. Why? Because in order to, in order to get a hospital, in order to expand your hospital, the number of beds in your hospital, if you own a hospital, so-called private, you have to submit to the state a statement of need, why you need more hospital beds. And all your competitors get to write in to the state saying, why well, you don't need additional hospitals. They don't want the competition. And so you cannot expand the hospital capacity or ICU capacity or any capacity without getting the state approval. Indeed, one of the things that the state did like in the middle of the crisis was say to hospitals, okay, okay, we, we, you know, for now you don't need to submit a certificate of, de of need, go do whatever you need to go do. I mean, all of that is absurd. If you look at any other business, when s demand goes up, what happens? First, prices go up. Second, supply goes up and prices come down. Well, if suddenly you have a pandemic and hospitals know that they're going to be flooded, what would they have done? They would have expanded supply. They would have figured out. They would have bought a hotel and turned it into a hospital. They would have bought a way. They would have done stuff to expand the supply. Same thing with masks. The same thing with ventilators. All these things, the thing that constrains their production is that we don't let the price system work. If, if soup, it, you take toilet paper, which is an easy one, right? If you'd allowed supermarkets to basically raise the price of toilet paper when uh, everybody wanted it, then people wouldn't have hoarded it because they couldn't afford to. They would have bought what they needed and they would have gone home. And then some people who manufactured toilet paper would have looked and said, wow, there's a huge amount of need for toilet paper and gone into production and produced toilet paper. This is Economics 101. Right? But when you tell supermarkets, oh, that's price gouging, and you can't raise the price, then, of course, what you get are shortages. Again, Economics 101, every freshman learns this in college, but we don't apply it because, oh, my God, you can't raise prices in the middle of the crisis. So what we need generally in every infrastructure is, is, um, is more freedom. I I'll give you one other one, and certainly this is true of education and housing. But I'll give you one other. I am very concerned about globalization. I'm very concerned about global trade. Uh, I am a huge proponent of global trade. I think it is, a, it is the right pro-freedom thing. You should be able to buy from anywhere in the world at whatever price people are willing to offer. And it should be your decision who to buy from, not Trump or any, any president or any, any bureaucrat. I think we're, gonna, we're entering a period where global trade is going to shrink, where we're going to see much more protectionism across the board where we're going to bring supposedly industries back. And that will guarantee a lower standard of living for Americans and for anybody else. It, higher prices, low standard of living, and fewer jobs. Actually, globalization creates more jobs than it destroys. Every economic study, every economic paper shows that. When you bring things back home, you actually destroy jobs. So those are, you know, I could go on and on for hours, but that, those, are, those are just some... Example. Some example. Yeah, well, I got to watch one of your videos. I think you were riffing a bit on uh, China, talking about China, the situation there. Um, I mean, it's. I read a piece in, I think it was Foreign Policy, 
a couple of weeks ago about China and they were saying how, you know, China, it's been no secret that China is light years ahead of the United States and we didn't have been. And that this pandemic. What what, 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 what are they light years away? What are they light years away? I think they were, I think the writer was referring to technology, AI, things like that. Um, I don't think any of that is true. I don't think any of that is true. um, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, the thing too with AI, that's a whole other thing. I, I just, I, I thought that I'd see a lot more things happening in AI and machine learning when it comes to the pandemic. I'm seeing some things being done, but I, I, I thought I'd see a lot more <laughs> at this point. Um, but um, you know, the the ba- the point the art the writer was making in the article was that now China is in a position it's like doing you know being generous with other countries the medical supplies and everything and the u.s is just looking worse and worse and worse and worse and china's looking better and better um what i mean do you see that do you what is your take on on china and globalization i'd separate two issues here one is the perception of a country globally and internationally and and look uh donald trump has destroyed whatever positive or much of the positive perception of the united states globally and his attitude towards trade, his attitude to immigration, and, and many of his other attitudes have, have created a lot of ill will in other countries, and justifiably so. Uh, and China is trying to f- come in and fill the gap and, and pretend that they're the good guys and everybody's, everybody's going to be nice. And I think to some extent they su- succeed in that, but everybody knows what they're really trying to do. I don't think anybody's going to be fooled. And people are suspicious of China. Um, so I think. I think I think people have way too positive a view of China's economy China, and China's ability and China's strength and China's ability to flourish in the future. Uh, China has become more and more authoritarian over the last five years. This President Xi is a disaster for China. He will bring China down and he already has started to bring China down. Uh, the Chinese economy shrunk for the first time in 40 years. Since 1978, I think 6.8% last quarter. Um, China can't afford to shrink. China is a poor country. On a per capita GDP basis, China is way behind the United States. Way, way, way behind the United States in terms of in terms of wealth. Uh, China's technology, to a large extent, is either copied or stolen from the U.S. because of the lack of freedom. There is no great innovation going on in China. When you look at things like the stuff they're using for social, their social score, facial recognition, spying on people, that's Israeli technology, American technology. It's technology that they've taken and adapted, but it's not homemade technology. Um, to, to be successful economically and to be successful technologically, you need freedom. To the extent China allows their industries and their tech industry to be free, to that extent, they succeed. And that's what happened from 1978 till about five years ago. There was massive liberalization, opening up freedom in China. About five years ago, they started shutting down. I think that shutting down, shutting down the freedom, more controls, more central planning will make China less able to grow the economy. I think it'll make China more desperate. Uh, And it'll make China poorer. And, uh, you know, we will see what happens. I think the uh, long term, there's real risk of civil war in China as as people who are poor now not advancing into middle class because the economy is not growing very fast. They they go out into the streets. And, uh, you know, what happens in a world of where everything is streamed when you have another Tiananmen Square? I mean, the Chinese are terrified of this. The Chinese authorities, the Communist Party is terrified of this. So I, I think China is in trouble. I think their troubles are internal. Their troubles are economic. Their troubles are social. Their troubles are how do they control their own population. And, you know, the, the way they handled this pandemic was a disaster. They, they penalized the people who actually were providing information. Uh, I mean, there, there was a courageous doctor who provided information early on, and he ended up dying from, from COVID-19. So uh, and and uh, the Chinese hid this and and just distorted the facts and their population knows this. So I think China's in trouble. I don't think other countries uh, buy their benevolence. I think other countries are skeptical about it. 
And, um, and I think people have seen through uh, their authoritarianism and, uh, and the consequence of them, um, in a sense, repressing information. And so people are going to be, I think they're going to have a hard time with regard to trade. I think a lot of people are going to hesitate to trade with them, particularly in the developed world. Uh, people are going to hesitate to give them new technologies or to sell them new technologies. We're already seeing the backlash against 5G from uh, from the Chinese companies and even in the UK shifting to to different technologies so that the Chinese don't get a foothold in, in the UK. So I think China's in trouble. I, I think it would be a mistake to view China as benefiting from what's going on in the world right now. China needs a robust Europe, a robust United States, and and a, a Europe and the U.S. that want to trade with it. And uh, so I think as globalization declines, which I think is what's going to happen, I think global trade declines, China is a huge loser. The United States is a huge, I mean, it's a lose-lose proposition. If trade is win-win, the essence of trade is win-win, the essence of tariffs and, and restrictions on trade is lose-lose. China loses, the U.S. loses, the West loses. Uh, and 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 there's no way out of this. The whole belt and whatever belt and highway project that they have cannot succeed without massive trade. And there's no indication the world is heading towards massive opening openness and trade. Okay, we only have a couple, ten more minutes, so I just have two more questions. Sure. Um, sure. What is your take on the idea of universal basic income? There's been conversation around that, especially sure. as of late, for obvious reasons. What do you think about that? Are you for that? And how would it even be possible? So I think there are proposals that would that are feasible in terms of U, uh, UBI. So I, I don't think it's unfeasible. I don't think it's it's a crazy idea. And indeed, there's a there's a version of it that I'm sympathetic to, and 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 the only version I'm sympathetic to is a version where basically we replace all social programs with UBI. But that would mean all social programs, everything, all the welfare programs. But I would even throw in healthcare into that. I would do away with Medicare and Medicaid and give, you know, so everybody gets a check. And with that check, they have to buy health insurance. They have to pay for their own food, pay for their own education, you know, do whatever they need to do, right? And they don't expect anything else from the government. And if we could, as a consequence of UBI, shut down the entire welfare state bureaucracy, get rid of all those employees. And, you know, right now we have, I don't know, 500 different welfare programs, little minutia, you know, food stamps and help for this and help for that and help for these people, help for those people. If we got rid of all of that and just replaced it all with one check from the government every month. Then, you know, there's a huge increase in efficiency there, right? Because you, you, you get rid of a bureaucracy. You turn people who are not very productive into people who now go out and seek productive jobs. And you actually create markets. So, for example, if you gave old people a check and said you have to buy insurance with this, then you suddenly create a health insurance market for old people that replaces Medicaid, which I think is much more productive, much better for our healthcare system, much more efficient than Medicare which is a one size fit all program that distorts the market in dramatic ways, in really, really big ways. So that's the so way that's in which the I, it's the only way I think UBI can work. But philosophically, I'm opposed to it even then, right? Because I'm opposed to redistribution of wealth. I'm opposed to taking from some people and giving to others. So I would propose UBI, let's say we said everybody gets 20,000 a year or 15,000 a year. And then I'd say, okay, but realize this. Everywhere, every year, uh, other than, let's say, for seniors, everybody else, we're going to cut it by $1,000. So in 20 years, UBI is going to be zero, and there's no welfare state. So start planning. Start saving. Start organizing your life so that, so that when the government stops helping you, you're in a position that you can afford to take care of yourself. So it's a way to, in my view, it's a way to transition us from a, 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 a welfare state that tries to control every aspect of our life today to a truly free society one day down the road. Um, but as a transition, it's far superior to what we have now with, with this insanity of the bureaucracy of, of the kind of welfare state we have. Okay. 
my last question is about Puerto Rico. Well, I'd love to know what brought you here, but maybe we'll save that for another conversation because I know you've only got five, <laughs> six minutes. Um, uh, so I'm working on a, a separate piece right now for Forbes about um, Produce. Do you order uh, Produce and Uva? Two delivery services here. Produce yep. delivers yep. all fresh, organic food yep. from farmers, yep. local farmers, and Uva is groceries and restaurants, and they've expanded to pharmaceutical and essential needs. And yep. as you can imagine, their subscriptions have skyrocketed the last month because everybody yep. needs these things. Yep. And so we're looking at, you know, obviously Puerto Rico relies on imports very, very, very heavily. We're looking at is is it possible? What, what, what would it take for, for Puerto Rico to be less reliant on imports? And, and can we someday have a more self-sufficient island? Look, Puerto Rico is a basket case. It's an economic basket case. I gave a talk. Um, I, I've been on the island for two, months, uh, two years and three months. So I came January 1st, uh, 2018. And uh, three months later in March, I gave a talk. Uh, in Puerto Rico, on how Puerto Rico could become the Hong Kong of the Caribbean. Because why not, right? It's a beautiful island. It's got friendly people. It's got talented people. They do fine when they move to the U.S. It's just here they seem to screw everything up. Um, it's, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful beaches. It should be a tourist haven, but it should be a producing haven. Should, there should be skyscrapers everywhere. I mean, this should be... A, a financial and, and hub on the Caribbean. And what's stopping it? Well, to do that, you have to look at why Hong Kong was Hong Kong. And basically, Hong Kong is Hong Kong because it's free. It's, so if you take, take um, the number of people who work for the government in, in, in Puerto Rico versus Hong Kong. In Puerto Rico, a third of all people employed work for the government. In Hong Kong, 5%. So the first thing I would do is fire you know, 90% of government employees in Puerto Rico. Because they are, one of the things that you realize as an economist is people who work for the government, most of them, not all of them, but 80 to 90% of them are actually destroying wealth. That's their job. It's to destroy wealth. It's get in the way of producers. It's get in the way of developers. It's get in, getting in the way of wealth creation. So, you know, I, I, I gave an example. Why can't Puerto Rico become the first state in the U.S. to do things like fire the DMV, and make the issuance of a driver's license online, right? Why can't I sit in front of a computer screen, fill out a form, the computer can take a picture of me. All of that is emailed to some agency where they verify the information electronically. You could do that with, uh, with blockchain. You could verify that all the information I gave is true. And then they download my driver's license onto my iPhone. I mean, why do you need one person to work at the DMV if that can happen, right? You don't. Everything could be electronic. So technology today, but it could, could, could replace many government employees. And then what you need to do is free up developers to develop, free up, uh, you know, I'm here because I'm, you probably are familiar with Act 20 and 22. So I'm, I'm benefiting from Act 20 and 22. So I have a very, very low tax rate. Why shouldn't Puerto Ricans have a low tax rate? Why should I pay more less taxes than Puerto Ricans? Why doesn't Puerto Rico institute a flat, 10% tax rate. Not just, do you know that Puerto Rico has the second highest corporate tax rate on the planet Earth? It's like almost, I think they lowered it recently a little bit, like the 30 something percent. Why doesn't Puerto Rico institute a flat 10% personal income tax rate and corporate tax rate? 10% across the board, all taxes are 10%. We already have a high sales tax rate in Puerto Rico. And live within your means, then start cutting the bureaucracy, lay people off, get rid of, to open a business. I mean, I, I'm a business owner. I have two businesses in Puerto Rico. The amount of, of forms and little taxes I have to pay, little fees here and fees there. It's in a municipality here. And I, I hire an accountant to do all that. Another unproductive job of somebody who just, just you know, works between me and the government to, to, to smooth things out. All of this should be easy and simple. You want to make it as business friendly as possible. The way, the way Hong Kong does it is only 5% of the people employed on the island work for the government. And as a consequence, there are almost no regulations. There are almost no constraints. There is development. If you want to start a business, you can start it. You know, you can get a license in a day. The business taxes are minimal and trivial and easy to pay. 
the forms are non-existent, so easy to fill out. That's what, Puerto, and, and of course, you need to get rid of the corruption. I mean, you know the story here in Puerto Rico about the testing equipment. They basically hired a construction firm to go buy medical tests. And the construction firm happened to be owned by somebody who contributes a lot of money to the political party, in the rules Puerto Rico. So the corruption has to disappear. But the way you make corruption disappear is you shrink through all the government. If government can't hand out favors, people don't lobby it. So make it impossible for the Puerto Rican government to hand out favors by shrinking it, by reducing its power, by taking it out of the economy. The more government intervenes in the economy, the poorer we are. The more freedom we have, the richer we are. This is my case about China, by the way, what I argued about China. When China became really, really grew fast, it's when the government didn't intervene much in the economy. When China is now intervening heavily in its economy, the economy is going to grow much slower, if at all. So Puerto Rico needs to adopt the same legal, you know, the same kind of structures as every country that's ever got become rich has adopted. And that is protect property rights and get out of the way. It's really, it's actually super simple. It's super shocking that nobody actually does it. You know, you've got Hong Kong, you've got Singapore, and that's about it. Nobody's actually practiced the mechanisms to get rich. It's easy. It's not that hard. It's politically hard, but actually, in reality, it's not that hard. All right. Wow. Well, thank you. Sure. It's been an absolute pleasure sure. speaking with you. And.